Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Monday uh, webinar. Today, we'll have Asandas Reed followed by Singapore Exchange Limited. And then we'll cover the highlights for the June FOMC and end with Singapore Weekly. So without further ado, I'll pass my time over to Natalie for Asandas Reed. Thank you, Timothy, and good morning, everyone. So this morning, we released a report on uh, uh, Sanders Reed. It it's an update. Um, the next slide, please. So we'll start off with the, with the 1Q2021 update first. Uh, just a quick one. On the positive side, we note, we note that the reversions uh, for the portfolio was positive at 3%. Um, this was driven by reversions in the US of 6.2% as well as in Singapore of 2.9%. So um, reversions in Singapore stronger than that, than that recorded last quarter, um, which was 0.9%. So the recovery in Singapore um, rents was driven by the logistics business park and light industrial uh, asset classes, which posted 5.6%, 2.8%, and 0.8% reversions. So on the negative side, port portfolio occupancy slid quarter on quarter from 91.7% to 90.6%. Uh, and this was due to non-renewals in Australia as well as in Singapore. So in, Austra in Singapore, um, there were two main assets that actually contributed to the occupancy decline. So it's uh, which which dropped from eighty eight point four percent to eighty six point nine percent. So one of the assets was one three eight depot depot road, as well as um, uh, uh, the the as well as another building uh, which now has a zero percent occupancy. Um, previously, the the building has a high occupancy in the fourth quarter of twenty twenty. So Australia. Um, similarly, Australia, one of the assets in Australia also um, has a 0% occupancy, which was previously 100%. Yeah. However, this um, asset, which is located at one distribution place, now um, uh, the, the manager actually has already um, has some tenants uh, lined up for the space. So occupancy is expected to improve. Uh, the, there was also an acquisition of... Um, in, in May, that was announced in May for the remaining 75% stake in Galaxis uh, for 543.8 million uh, Singapore dollars. So, um, so just a little bit of background on, on this asset. Uh, as an ARI actually acquired 25% stake in this asset um, 13 months ago, uh, so on the, on the 31st of March 2020. Uh, and so the, the announcement that was that was released in May was for the remaining 75% stake. So effectively, Ascenders will then own 100% stake in Galaxies, uh, which is a business park located in One North. So upon upon the full um, upon attaining full ownership of Galaxies, uh, Aerie can then apply for the conversion to LLP status, which will allow um, the entity holding Galaxies to qualify for tax transparency. So currently, um, Galaxis is held by a private limited company, which is subjected to a 17% uh, corporate tax. So after this conversion, there will, be, there will then be tax savings. On a pro forma basis, uh, this, this acquisition is DPU accretive uh, at 0.46%. Uh, and what, what's, what's good about this asset is that it actually sits on a, on a land which has a relatively long land lease of 51 years. Uh, and this compares to the kind of land tenures that um, we are seeing that are coming out from the government land sales, uh, GLS for short. So the current GLS, um, we, we, we frequently see um, land tenures of 20 to 30 years. Occupancy at this asset is relatively high, 98.6%. Uh, and it is home to renowned tenants such as C, Canon and Oracle. So the table on the bottom right hand side actually summarizes the valuation um, at a point in time where um, the 25% stake was announced as well as the 75% stake. So as you can see the agreed property valuation 
um, actually increased by 14.3% since uh, March 2020. So of course that has resulted in the compression of the MPIU. Um, at the time of the, of the initial stick, uh, MPIU was about 6.2% and it has uh, since compressed to 5.4%. Um, okay, there was also a divestment of three logistic assets uh, that was announced in early June. <clears throat> So these three logistic assets are located um, in Australia, two of them in Brisbane and one of them in Melbourne. Uh, and they were divested at 16.8% above book valuation. So these assets are actually occupied, 100% uh, occupied. So divesting these assets uh, at above book valuation allows AREIT to actually recognize um, upside from this asset immediately. Moving on to the outlook. So for the outlook, uh, demand remains muted as companies uh, exercise caution and tenants avoid relocation costs and that has actually led to higher retention in the first quarter. Uh, electronics and biomedical uh, sectors account for 29.3 as well as 34% of the new demand in the first quarter of 2021 and this has helped to prop up demand for the light industrial, high spec and business park assets respectively. Um, in terms of lease expiries, 13.9% of uh, leases by GRI are expiring um, from Singapore and mainly from business parks as well as logistic assets. So as mentioned earlier, um, the, the business parks and the, will actually benefit from the new demand uh, from biomedical um, tenants or, or from the biomedical sector. Uh, for the rest of the lease expiries, uh, 3%, 4%, and 2.4% um, for F FY21 lease expiries are coming from Australia, US, as well as UK. Overall, we maintain our, our buy call as well as raise our target price very slightly from 3.64 to $3.65. <clears throat> we have adjusted our DPU to reflect um, you know, the acquisition of Galaxis as well as the divestment of the assets. Um, and we have tweaked our DPU by um, negative 0.5% for FY21 as well as 0.8% uh, for FY22. Um, we, are, we have forecasted a DPU growth of 9.2% as the acquisitions as well as redevelopment in AEIs start contributing. So for this year, uh, grab, the grab built to suit asset will be completed and start contributing in the third quarter of 2021, as well as Ubix, which is um, uh, light, which is actually 2729, uh, located at 2729 Ubi Road. And they were previously a light industrial assets and they have been converted to high spec assets. And this will be completed in the fourth quarter of 2021. So that's all for Ascenders. Um, and now I'll pass the time on to Terence for SGX. Yeah, thanks Natalie. And good morning, everyone. Uh, like our, the title of our report, SGX, on SGX is taking multi-asset business to the next level, which is what they detailed, which is the, the plans that they detailed in their analyst day to strengthen its core business and invest in its next leg of growth uh, during the analyst day that they conducted. So for us, we see three main positives from the analyst day. Firstly, the SGX has committed to remain focused on building its multi-asset exchange. Uh, they will expand its suite of products and new product development. So if you look at the chart here on your left-hand side, you can see that for uh, fixed income, uh, the fixed income business currencies and uh, commodities business, this, this now take up about 20% uh, of their overall revenue in the first half of 2021. Together with the DCI business, this, this forms about 33% of overall revenue uh, in the first half of financial year 2021 this year versus 15% uh, in financial year 2015, which is about five years ago. So you can see that SGX has really started to diversify their revenue away from equities in the past, which, which, which have a higher weight to, to the other asset classes. So this revenue diversification uh, will, will enable SGX to have a uh, more diverse income stream and also grow their overall revenues as well. The second positive we see is the pipeline for growth. Uh, it, there, there are multiple pipelines for growth, which includes acquisitions, 
accelerating growth of scientific beta, which they acquired in January 2020, and building an integrated forex marketplace. So this scientific beta, which the boss acquired, will allow the group to create more new products, uh, such as ESG products, uh, and other smart indices products to mitigate the loss of its MSCI product volumes. Uh, the last positive that we see we, we took away from the meeting is the SGX uh, has actually we actually sees a healthy pipeline for the rest of 2021. The boss reports a healthy pipeline of potential listings across different sectors and geographies for the rest of 2021. They also hinted that they see potential listings of unicorns from the US via its NASDAQ partnership. In our next slide, we talk about one of the negatives from the, 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 the meeting. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, next slide. So I think there's a glitch. So that's bear with us for a while. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for thanks for bearing with us. The one of the negatives. Yeah, thanks. One of the negatives though that we see from uh, SGX uh, investments is that the short term margins are likely to be lower. Uh, he has set aside fifty five to sixty million dollars of capex to modernize his systems architecture digitalize and invest in his foreign exchange and fixed income business. So he expects these investments to increase his revenue CAGR from to about 7 to 9% in the medium term. This is up from the 6% CAGR uh, that he has in the last five years. So they, they expect these investments, even though the short-term margins will be impacted, but it will increase their overall CAGR, accelerate the, the overall revenue CAGR to 7 to 9% uh, in, the, in the next few years. In terms of our recommendation, we maintain accumulate with a higher target price of $11.25, up from $11.01 previously. Our target price is now packed to its historical five-year mean of 23 times PE, up from minus one standard deviation previously to capture its longer-term prospects. So if you look at the chart here on your left-hand side, our valuations were previously based on uh, minus one standard deviation uh, of, of SGX. So, but we, we now we now move it our valuations to, to which is about 21 times but we now move it to the five year mean which is about 23 times which is the the, the is, is five year historical average on account of it is is better outlook so that's all from me i'll now pass on the time to timothy thanks terence uh we'll just go through some of the fomc june highlights that was uh held last week Okay, so there was no changes to the Fed funds rate uh, last week, but the main change was that the, the expectations for rate hikes was pushed forward uh, into 2023. So back in March, in their March meeting, there was no, no expected rate hikes in 2023. But in this June, due to higher uh, than expected inflation, uh, they pushed two hikes into 2023. So they're now expecting two hikes in 2023, earlier than the market expected. So the average inflation actually surged and uh, is above their 2% target already since, 20, since the 2020 recession began. And so that's why you can see that the equity markets are, are pulling back a bit due to the high, the, the early expectations of interest uh, rates hikes. Uh, what was unchanged was the rates at the moment, the asset purchase policy also is, is also unchanged and the longer run uh, Fed funds rates of 2.5% is also still unchanged. So for the outlook from this, uh, the highlights, first of all, there's no timeline for the tapering or selling of assets as of now. 
but they are having discussions now on whether they are going to uh, they're going to decide whether to scale back their bond purchases due to the good US economic recovery. The spike in inflation is, is expected to be transitory. So they expect it to, to come down back to normal levels, commodity prices to come down as well as the economy uh, reopens, renormalizes. And they're already seeing it in the US as the economy is already being reopened. Uh, there's a, also a, a a bias towards a stronger USD. This is due to earlier rate hikes and also the inevitable shrinking of the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, with regards to the shrinking of the Fed balance sheet, the market expects it to expect some hints uh, in the 26 to 28 August Fed annual symposium in Jackson Hole. So that's a that's a key event to watch out for in the future. Uh, with regards to the market performance in a, on a historical basis, back in 2013, there was also an unexpected uh, tapering announcement by the Fed and so we can look at how the market reacted to that unexpected uh, announcement. So in 2013, if you look at the chart on the top right hand, right -hand side, that's the, that's the performance of the FTSE Singapore indexes that we have. So the market actually declined at that time also due to the unexpected uh, announcement. Uh, so the, the Straits Times index fell about 10% in one month. Uh, but the outperformers were technology and energy sectors. So they fell about 6% uh, to 7% plus uh, compared to the others. If you look at the tr post three months performance after the announcement, the Straits Times Index still remained at a negative 10% in the uh, territory. So uh, it, you can sort of expect that uh, kind of levels uh, due to this unexpected rate hike also. Uh, the earlier rate hikes. But if you look at the technology and energy sectors as well, uh, they also tend, uh, they also saw a performance in the three months uh, post the announcement. So this, that's the historical performance for these uh, sectors. And the laggard due to the earlier rate hike announcements back then also was, the laggard was real REITs. So because uh, high interest rates affects their interest payments and of course their DPU. So that's just some color on the, the history of unexpected uh, uh, rate hikes. So uh, that's all for me. I'll pass my time on to Paul. Yeah, thanks, Timothy. I'll move on to uh, Singapore Weekly. Uh, in terms of macro data from Singapore, there were, there were quite a number of uh, data coming out from Singapore. Uh, I think the main one, I guess it's pretty important since it comes out every 10 years, the census data. Uh, the, so some of the conclusions, at least from, from our point of view was that uh, looking at the data, the property prices uh, is seem to be uh, su well supported by the rise in housing incomes. Uh, we'll show you a chart later. Uh, the other one that uh, was noticeable was of course the Singapore aging. Uh, if you do some big envelope calculations, I think that our aging levels, which is if you look at the, the old age dependency ratio, I mean we are roughly like 20 years behind Japan. So by 2030, we'll, our aging levels will be like somewhat similar to Japan in 2010. If, just some estimates there. Uh, in terms of the population targets, uh, I think they were below our so-called 2013 white paper, if some of you can recall, uh, mainly due to slower than expected uh, non-resident uh, numbers. Uh, some positives we got was from our first quarter uh, jobs data. So we added 14,000 workers in first quarter. Uh, this is the first increase we had in five quarters, um, but it's still a net 167,000 losses of uh, job, net job losses since the pandemic began in 2020. Uh, and this is across all sectors. And I was actually a bit surprised that even in the first quarter 21, the manufacturing sector still shed jobs. Uh, I, I guess the one, one way to play this is that the services sector saw the sec two quarters of growth, and I guess the one that benefits would be HR net. Uh, in terms of the property market, the, the, the URA released data for May and the numbers was, was very strong. So if you look at the units sold excluding EC, it was about 881 units. So this is like almost a doubling year on year. But, uh, but of course, me, you're comparing with the COVID year. So if you look at uh, year to date, at least the first five months versus the, of this year, compared to the first five months of last year, uh, about 5,700 units, we are still up almost double, about 5,700. So the housing market, uh, is, is, is very robust for this year. 
Uh, in terms of exports, also was a, a, a positive number. I think the exports is up about 8.8% compared to the uh, last month's 6%. But of course, export numbers can be uh, somewhat you know, volatile. So when we compare how the May exports compared to pre-pandemic, which is like May 19, actually we are still up 4%. So the export numbers are also positive. Another positive was RMC demand ready mix. So these are building materials. And as mentioned in last week, so the construction sector is doing well. And we can see that also in RMC demand. Uh, for April, the numbers was three times. But you no know, April 20, there was virtually no RMC demand. So it's hard comparable. But when you look at the year to date numbers, at least the first four months, uh, it's still up 12%. So at least we are beginning to see a recovery in the construction sector in terms of the jobs awarded and also the building materials. Uh, later, we'll, we'll just run through uh, Mimion Tech and Marco Polo for those who did not attend our Poons webinar last week. Uh, in terms of our tactical views, uh, we are sticking to the reopening trade. Uh, I think if you listen to the Ministry's Task Force briefing on Friday, I, I think one thing they did mention is that they're looking at the milestone of 70 to 75 of people fully in Singapore fully vaccinated and they are looking for really uh, broader reopening measures including border opening. So uh, what that means is that they are looking for very more aggressive reopening measures I think once they get it fully vaccinated. Now, uh, some of the reasons the rationale given was that uh, although this pandemic I'm sorry this the COVID-19 is endemic uh, that means it will be circling around for some time but uh, what they've observed is that uh, those that are those that were vaccinated and and still got infected, the those that there were only like one percent that required oxygen. So so if you take like I don't know nine maybe 80, 90 percent effective rate, then the the out of the uh, only ten percent were infected. Then out of that ten percent, only one percent required some oxygen support. Then I, I think that gives them some confidence that the vaccine is working, even with the new strains. Uh, so this will be, should be positive for you know, hospitality and transport as we think the reopening will be accelerated and I think we are way past those uh, circuit, breaker or, circuit breaker or lockdown, even partial lockdown measures. Uh, the other noticeable thing I think this week was there was some uh, reversal in the strength of commodity prices. That means commodity prices are starting to, to correct and also beginning to see the US dollar strengthening up to two month highs. Uh, in terms of our performance webinars, uh, uh, we will have uh, Enviro Hub, the, the glove maker want to be uh, in the next few days on, on the 24th. Then next week, we'll have the, the I guess, the more popular one, which is uh, SPH. Uh, uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the companies there that you see, you give us some time, we need to read, put uh, lock them up into poems. And we will also have our third quarter strategy, which is on the 10th of July, 10 a.m. Ne next slide. Uh, okay, in terms of the Number of global pandemic cases, the blue line. Um, the positive is that right now we are almost close to the year lows. So we are hitting like 368 versus the 354,000, which, which was trending the lows in, in late February. And the good thing is that we are declining globally. The cases is declining 44% month on month. So we should be able to hit the, the year lows maybe next week or, or the month after. Uh, the, the other positive was that if you look at the orange line, which is a bit hard to see, sorry for that, but you can see that the cases in the US are trending down very fast. They're even back to the low since, uh, sorry, March 20, not March 21. So they are back to the levels where the pandemics just started to emerge in, in the US. So in US has kind of uh, con controlled the number of new cases very well. Uh, of course, in UK, uh, we all saw the news, uh, the cases in UK are rebounding back to almost 8,000 levels. Uh, next slide. Uh, if you move to Singapore, uh, uh, there was a spike in the cases, 108, the total number of cases for the past seven days compared to the prior seven days. And, and that's mainly because of the new cluster in, in Bukit Merah, about 50 plus cases. Uh, so the average daily community cases is back to 15. Uh, so these are much higher than you know, the, the, the mid-June last year when we had phase two and phase, uh, phase three in late December. So, so we are, so it's, that's why I guess they cut back on some of the the reopening measures. And what was mentioned is that right now, fully vaccinated is 35%, and any border reopenings de depends on the vaccination rate. So once the vaccination rate hit the so-called 70 or 75% so-called herd immunity, I think uh, the authorities will get more and more aggressive in like reopening and relaxing more measures. Uh, next slide. 
uh, in terms of okay, it, this is just for interest. I mean, it's, it's not going to make change our decision in buying stocks or but since the the census was up, we wanted to look at how the our the the number of the citizens compared to the so called twenty thirteen white paper. So the the population target, if, if you look at this table, I know it's a bit complicated, but you look at the actual, so under the population actual, uh, by end of 2020, we hit about 5.68 million population. But this is below the white paper's target of 5.8 to 6. So this is one way to read it. Then one of the reasons is uh, the residents, actually, we met the target of 4.04, of uh, between uh, whereas compared to the target of 4 to 4.1. Uh, uh, and then the one that, that dragging was the uh, non-residents. Uh, again, this is all just for reference. And uh, But one thing, one important thing is that no, uh, the increase in residents is important. I think if you look like even like a company like Netlink, they always mention that one way to grow is the, is the increase in resident population. So they're looking at you know, 20 to 25,000 households. And, and this is important, although it's only like 1% growth, but at least they still can grow their customer base. So that's why Although these numbers might be a bit uh, no, uh, uh, thematic and a bit longer term, but it's, it's really helpful that if we get higher population growth, it can help a lot of the uh, domestic companies here. Uh, the table on the bottom is, again, uh, assuming we want to hit the 2030 targets, uh, how would the numbers look like? So uh, the number, one way to read it is between 2011 to 2020, the annual increase in residents was about 27,000. So if you're going to hit the 20, 30 lows, we're actually slowing down the number of residents. But if you hit the high, is 35. Again, all this is just for, for, for reference. And what we do not want is you no know, uh, slower slow down in resident population. And you know, they, that affects uh, property market. That affects a, a lot of other sectors. Again, this is just purely for, for reference. And, and next, next slide. Okay, the other thing that we took the census data and then we looked at the the income levels, and then we compared to the property price, the change between 2010 and 2020. Uh, so the table on the left, what we did was we took the average income for per household. Uh, then we divided it by the property price. So the average property price in 2010, uh, these are actual transactions, was about 1.62 million. You look at the bottom right. Uh, and then in 2020, it was 2 million. So if just uh, looking at this, you can see that the so-called affordability level, just based on this metric, has actually improved. So the income levels are actually grown faster than the property price, which is which is positive uh, in a general sense. So that uh, no, we are, the property price is not outgrowing income levels, and then you know this basically means that it's not affordable and a lot of more speculation involved. So this time around, it's at least supported by the income levels at at, at least disclosed by the census level, uh, census data. Uh, the table on the right is just to show the number of households uh, earning more than 15,000 uh, a month. Uh, the reason why this is important is that when you look at the data, um, the, in terms of the total private property owners, uh, half of them actually earn more than 15,000. So we just want to get a sense of the pool of people who could afford it. So although the average is up, but is it just limited to a few people? Uh, of course, especially not me, but uh, so we just wanted to look at the number of people that were earning more than 15,000. So you compare 2010 to 2020, the number jumped uh, 271%. Uh, but in terms of the this, uh, those earning more than 15,000 that own private property, pro private property, actually the number jumped less than that. So uh, again, just, just, we just wanted to see that whether it's the higher property price and so forth uh, uh, supported by by the, the increase in wage levels and the increase in the number of people earning higher wages. So uh, uh, the numbers were positive, I guess, it's, uh, in a way, in a nutshell, I mean, poverty prices were kind of supported by the improvement in income levels. And it's not so much uh, pure speculation and so forth. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, okay, this is just a chart between the commodity price and US dollar. The US dollar is inverse. So when it goes up, means it's actually depreciating. So there is... There is some correlation. I mean, if you look when then the property price rise, I think the US dollar tends to weaken. So right now, what we're just trying to say is that the commodity prices has spiked up uh, parabolically. So th there is some risk that this thing could, could correct. And one thing is that you can see the US dollar starting to appreciate. That means the red line is actually coming down uh, to two-month levels. Again, uh, this is not a forecast. It's just an observation. Uh, and of course, the Chinese are also releasing a lot more commodities 
uh, their state reserve commodities. Uh, so that could also kind of pressure uh, commodities prices. This is just out of interest because there's a lot of talk now right now that, that you could see reversal in these two, two, two asset classes. Uh, next, next slide. Okay, uh, this is uh, in reference to our poems webinar. I know uh, those who did not attend, you don't, we just wanted to brief everyone what this company is. It is not non-rated and it's a small company, but at least uh, you can understand what they do and what is generally their story. So this company is a uh, market cap of 56 million. They've been in, in build, they have been in the water treatment business for more than 30 years. Uh, I, I guess one positive is that their order book is 93 million, which is like more than two times the FY20 revenues. Uh, the types of revenue that they make is EPC means you no, know, they just they build water treatment plants. Uh, operation maintenance is that after you build, someone needs to maintain it, so uh, they get one source of revenue. And the other unique thing about them is they actually sell water. So it's almost like a Moya mini me kind of uh, is because they sell a uh, pipe of maybe tap water in in those. Uh, you can see on the table, the picture on the right, the red dots. So these are parts in Indonesia where they sell uh, tap water. Uh, Jakarta, Bandung, I guess, Pekanbaru and so on. Uh, the, the next bullet point is just the type of customers. So they not only serve your PUB in Singapore, they also serve uh, F&B companies, palm oil industry. Uh, the next one, I, will, I won't go through. The, the only thing is, I think the profit is quite small. They only make like oh, no, one plus million. And when you compare them to, to the two notable ones like Sun Lee, and Moya, uh, the difference is that Sunny doesn't serve so much the private sector and they don't have uh, Indonesia or they don't own no water concessions like them, the BOT and TOT. Uh, and then the other thing is, of course, Moya is somewhat similar. So Moya has a huge, uh, they supply in Jakarta a, a huge BOT, that means they, they supply tap water. Basically, they will treat the river water and then they just sell it to the public and all, or even private sectors that might want to buy the tap water from them. Uh, uh, so in terms of Singapore, uh, the, the, the authorities here at least, we've got quite, quite aggressive plans to raise the, the contribution of desalination. Uh, I won't run through too much, but uh, anyway, you can see that uh, from 2019 to 2030, the next 10 years, they're going to, to increase 50% the amount of, uh, of new water. They're going to double the amount of desalination. So there's a lot of opportunities for projects for, I guess, those involved in the water sector. Uh, and then for Singapore, I mean for Indonesia, you know, in, in Jakarta now a lot of it is groundwater, so they are moving more to and then and and they're running out of groundwater, so they are moving more to to you no know, tap water, you no know, treating the water from the rivers and then supplying tap water. So the demand is, I think you can see that like, from twenty seven to forty six, uh, just for a reference in Jakarta. And next slide. Okay, the next one is uh, Marco Polo Marine. Uh, uh, it is non-rated. We don't have coverage, but, uh, but just to give you some highlights of, of what happened. And so they were founded in 1991. So what happened was during the oil and oil crisis, I think they had to refinance debt, and, and they had they secured 60 million of, of new equity from nine investors. Uh, they also mentioned that the cost of these new investors is 3.2 cents. Uh, so right now, the after the whole restructuring, they have two sources of revenue. Uh, they have uh, ship chartering, you know, basically renting out ships. Uh, I think uh, 11 OSVs, I think we all, some of us who remember the painful OSV, uh, um, which is, you can see the picture on the far top right. Uh, so they own 11, then they own some top budgets. Uh, the demand from what they mentioned was that, uh, although all prices have increased, you don't really see really strong demand uh, in, in AHTS yet. Uh, the prices range from 60 cents to a dollar. It's off its lows of 40 cents per horsepower, but uh, it, it is not like very vibrant and so forth. It's just stable with all prices at these levels, the demand is more stable. Uh, they also do shipbuilding. They have three dye docks in, in Batam. Not much of new orders for ships, but they do a lot of repair work. And part of the reasons is uh, because of the labor issues in Singapore, there's a lot of, uh, um, a lot of orders from Singapore uh, diverted to Indonesia for repair work at least. Uh, the main opportunity for them will be in Taiwan. So uh, uh, Taiwan has a 15 gigawatt offshore wind pl uh, plan. So right now only five gigawatt has been awarded. So uh, there's another 10 more that could be that could be awarded. So there's huge opportunity there. And what they wanted to show you is that uh, one turbine is is only six to to eight megawatts. So you need like almost 15. Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, you need. 
about 130 to 140 turbines for one gigawatt and then you need AHTS. So what the AHTS does is that they will help transport uh, the turbines, the whole transportation to install. So there's a lot of work for demand for AHTS and all these AHTS need to be, uh, I guess, non-China non made, uh, Indonesia made and so forth. Uh, the other thing they mentioned is that there's this opportunity for this uh, particular vessels, uh, larger vessels called service SOV. Basically, what it means is that after you install all this offshore wind, uh, you need this huge vessel to maintain uh, because one gigawatt is 130 turbines. So you need to go to each turbine no, and let's go do maintenance work and you need such a vessel. So there could be an opportunity for them to build such vessels. So uh, Taiwan alone, I mean, on paper, you need maybe 15, 10 to 15 of such SOVs, but so far only there's only one ordered in Asia. So there's opportunity there for them. I think, uh, of course, whether they, they, op they own it or not, not, it's not clear, but you see that's where the opportunity lies. Uh, the other parts won't run, they're just going to participate in the rights issue. And, and the COVID has an impact because it will affect the crewing. Uh, again, so all this is a bit more detailed, but just to share with, with everyone some of the highlights of what's happening for this company. Okay, uh, next slide. I think that should be it. Uh, that should be the end. I think we can move on to QA. Hello. Yeah, so I think I'll take some of the, 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 bank, the bank questions and also the questions on SGX. Uh, so I'll read the first question. The bank stocks are dropping. What are the causes and any change to the outlook and TP? So the, what, the, the, one of the, the worst hit for, for in the last couple of days was uh, DBS. And, and uh, the reason why DBS dropped, I think for those who already read the news, uh, it was because of a problem with their uh the credit card uh charging so the there was a duplicate uh char count to the 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 charges to the the for some for, for some of their customers so what what we understand is that for the last over the weekend they really fixed this problem and those who who, who face this double charging uh, already received the reversal like, in their credit card statement so it, we don't see any any impact about I think I think the shares are are taking it taking a hit because of, of this latest uh, move but the, because because we, we see this 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 incident as largely one off so and, and also very temporal so that for us we don't there's no change to the the outlook and our target price for the banks also yeah I hope I answer your question uh, I'll go on to the next question uh SGX, what is DCI? So DCI is data connectivity and indices. So just to understand this, this means some of their, their like like what what we mentioned earlier on about their smart uh the smart smart beta acquisition. So the the ETFs, especially in the and also the the some of the indices like the ESG investing. So the what what they're trying to do is create more of these kind of ESG products. Uh, that, that that other investors can that, that investors can invest in. Yeah. So another question: What is SGX doing for the China Connect opening and SG access to ACS? Is Philip into the products offerings in this space? So there are two questions here. I think take the first one first. So for the the China Connect uh, opening the. SGX, they were they 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 are active in the fixed income and equity space. So in the, the fixed income space, they they've actually got uh they actually collaborate with some of the, the banks in, in, in China to offer uh those those uh, bonds. So they have, they have one very big bond issuance, uh Roaming P bond 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 issuance uh, on the SGX uh uh some time ago, I think it was last year. Uh and, and I think I think going forward they will they will try to 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 
uh, get more of this uh, uh, China bond, triple A, it's not, not triple A, uh, triple A rated bonds, uh, government bonds from China uh, to, to lease on the, the Singapore exchange. So there's, there's one, uh, sorry, so there's, there's one uh, bond offering on the, the exchange already. Other than that, they also, they also try, continue to try to, to attract uh, equi equity issuances into Singapore and the, the equity, I think the, the, for last year, they managed to, to attract GHY uh, to lease on the, the, the main board of the exchange. So these are some of the, the, the things that they're trying to do. Uh, as, as for Philip, we, we, continue to, we continue to offer different products uh, on the, on the, the SGX space. Some of, some of these uh, are really listed like the fixed income uh, kind of uh, products that we have there. Uh, then there's one more question here. Is there much upside to buying banks still? Yeah, so the, 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 the banks are still currently trading below our, our, our target price for all, all three banks. I, we are, I think we are most bullish on DBS and OCBC at this, at this moment. For us, we, we, see, we see three main reasons. I don't think I'll just be, be very quick in, in, in summarizing that, but if you, you want us to go into detail, we can. So the first, the first reason, the, the first uh, catalyst that we see uh, in term, for the banks, the main catalyst is that we think that the Monetary Authority of Singapore MES will as a likely potential uh, removal of the dividend cap on the bank. So that, that's the first reason. We think the, the dividend cap, which was imposed in 2020 to, to help the banks preserve capital will likely be removed uh, in 2020. 21, we, we think that that's the likelihood, likelihood because the banks have already made very, very sufficient uh, uh, and significant buffers and provisions for some of the non-performing assets already. So this, this, this the, the huge capital buffers that is on their balance sheet now is actually weighing the banks down now because of the, weighing the banks down in terms of the ROE, like because, the, sorry, because the, because the banks are, are, are carry, holding a lot of cash. So, so, because because of that, the, the 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 we think there's a likelihood for the banks, the for the, the monetary authority to remove the cap, and then there's a possibility of a special dividend as well. Uh, we also think that there's a the second reason we think is uh, the uh, reversal of the gen, overall general provisions uh, if, that the banks have made again, like 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 what I mentioned earlier on, the banks have made significant general provisions. Uh, allowances in 2020, so they, they, they could follow uh, what DBS is doing and 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 do a reversal in 2021. So uh, so so that 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 will will boost the overall earnings for the the the, the banks. And then the third reason is that the over the names for the bank, the banks are also generally stable. In fact, the based on the like what my 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 colleague. Uh, Timothy mentioned the FOMC is extremely hawkish, so the the that there's the possibility of NIMS uh, actually NIMS we believe have really stabilized, but the, the possibility of NIMS going up higher uh, is 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 the the probability has has, has increased lah. So the, with this upside in NIMS, we think that that the the there be there be more upside for the banks. So so these are our three reasons lah, why we think the banks at these levels are still a little bit undervalued. If I'm not clear, please please just, just clarify that. I think that uh, I, I think that, 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 that I'll probably just 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 take a, a pause here and I'll just let my other colleagues weigh in. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think I'll go next. So yeah, um so this is the moment where I share the screen on yep. Okay, so uh, first of all, I think I'll go on to IFAS. Uh, I read through all the, most of the questions. So um, let's go through the unit gas. So unit gas, right, uh, if you can look at it, uh, unit gas is actually um, uh, have a very strong move above the, the $1 region already. Uh, in fact, uh, I think that there, there, there is a similarity of this. Uh, going forward uh, as compared to the whole thing. So um, further upside, yes, I think there is, but um, take note of the support at, uh, between 0 0.86 to 0 0.98. Uh, in fact, it, even, it, it, it even may go to $1 before rebound. So like just a psychological report, uh, support uh, level for union gas. Um, um, aside, aside on that, if you can look at that, uh, there's like the, the momentum on the RSI is like, 
uh, flattening. Uh, like so, there's like uh, if you compare the higher high and the higher lows, uh, there seems seems to be a flattening of the RSI. So hence, uh, going forward, I think there's some lackluster of um, volume going forward. So uh, I will I will advise that you know, for Union Gas, just take a wait a look at uh, approach, um, and you can look at the volume. Um, uh, there's a huge selling volume. Uh, I think this. Is um this volume is a lack of buying, so our uh, price is rapidly good dropping down uh for that. All right. So just move on to next one. Um, uh, next one will be the BS6, the Broadway Industrial B69, Broadway Industrial. Um, Broadway Industrial, I need to bring you to the weekly chart. Okay, so you do have you do see that it is a complete um downtrend um since um for, for the last 10 years. So um, only recently that it, it, it has a, a V-shaped rebound, uh, but yet on the weekly chart, sorry, uh, it, it has not cleared any significant high. And, and, and anyway, the high that you observe is much more of a corrective uh, in nature on the larger time frame. Okay, so the, the rising wedge is still pose a, still pose a significant threat. So let's move on to the daily chart. Okay, so uh, even though Pfizer has been trending above the 50 day moving average and the 200 day moving average. Um, price has actually rejected the resistance zone with a shooting star pattern on last week, uh, on the 16th of June. So it's all last Wednesday. So um, theoretically, if you look at it, um, this high, the 0 0.153 is now being being uh, broken. So a uh, price has a uh, immediate upside and then price uh, came down all the way. So uh, if you ask me where will be the next uh, target uh, for rebound, I would say that um, 0 0.130 offers a very good target for rebound. But um, I guess, my, my second guess and my second feeling is that 0 0.130 may not offer a very strong rebound. Uh, after all, so it may be just a very, very strong uh, correction uh, going forward like this. So, and goes down all the way. All right, so that's for Broadway. Our uh, next one will be on Singtel. Singtel, uh, uh, I will just be on uh, okay. Um, Singtel, it will be just on a that there, there is a like inverted head and shoulder, uh, potentially because the resistance zone between two point six four and two point six nine is yet to be broken. All right, so you can see that that uh, prices has been ranging in a box. Um, uh, hence I think if you look down, if you zoom zoom in into the daily chart. Uh, this will be the likely target uh, rebound for between at 2.14 to 2.1, Okay, if you look at the uh, the fall, falling wedge, uh, there may be a potential uh, falling wedge pattern going up, but uh, will price break this uh, short term? I think it, it will just hovering around the resistance zone. So all in all, in the mid term, 2.14 to 2.69 will be the, the activity range for Singtel. Uh, it will be very much ranging in, in the short term. Uh, you can judge see by the moving average EMA of 200 day and 50 day moving average. Um, price has been flattening uh, throughout. All right, so um, for, for Singtel, um, we have to be very careful. All right, um, price may not have a lot of volume going forward. And similarly, uh, just look at um, the RSI, there's a failure swing. Uh, failure negative thing, but uh, price did not sustain the upside, so it may dip down forward to, to the uh, extremely over over so zone. All right, so there there is which is confluence with my previous my my analysis that I, I mentioned earlier. Okay, so the next one will be uh, on on top glove, um, uh, top glove comfort Delgro and Capricorn. So for comfort. Okay, so comfort has been ranging uh, very much. So hence, um, price activity between the range is between 1.54 to 1.81 uh, region. Uh, any upside, I think 1.80 will be much cap it, uh, cap at it, and then followed by rebound. I don't foresee any, any strong rebound for, for cap comfort that will um, Likewise, uh, for, for capital, Capital initially has a strong rebound at 5.17, uh, 5.10 to 5.17 on the 14th May. So it's which is one month ago, but it fails to sustain above $5.40. Hence, um, the E-wave, which I mentioned earlier on, will be the one to one of AD. 
So uh, you most likely make a very uh, sub one, two, and then three. So which confluence with uh, 4.61 to 4.74 region uh, going forward. So, uh, but do expect some upside tomorrow, uh, but it will be a short one, uh, 5.17, will, uh, 5.25 will, will be the maximum target before a rebound down to 4.61 to 4.74 before a strong rebound uh, thereafter. Okay. Uh, I'll share about top love. Um, top love, um, I, I mentioned 1.14 to 1.32 still maintains uh, my major support. Um, price has a, uh, a blue threat of the of the falling wedge. So hence, uh, if you ask me, if price do make lower low, breaking be low here, then uh, I'll extend my falling wedge over here, uh, going forward. Okay. So it'll be something like this, still a bit of falling wedge, but it's not really that perfect as compared to this previously. All right. Okay. So let's see. So the next one will be uh Sing Xiong. Um Sing Xiong, Sing Xiong wise, uh, after the after last month, uh one month ago when government announced the phase two heightened alert, um uh, that no diving in allowed, uh Sing Xiong price uh, went up uh quite significantly. Uh, almost breaking the high at 1.65, but price came down with a momentum uh, descent. Um, it's much more corrective. So um, I'm eyeing at the support at 1.48 to 1.51 for temporary rebound to the outside. But whether price will actually break uh, target one, break 1.80, um, in the long run, I think highly unlikely. Major rebound zone uh, in the long term uh, remains at 1.32 to 1.38. Okay, as that. Aztec uh, has, a start, uh, has a very, very uh, significant rise after a true wave down since the, the debut of its IPO. Uh, but but it, it was met with a very strong sell down or three wave down. So if you were to measure the, um, the ones to one of the, uh, of the Aztec Global, then we, can, we are likely to target 0.64 going forward. And do take note that this one look like a, a head and shoulder formation going forward. So, um, likely one point, uh, likely this support zone at one point one four to one point one eight. If broken, then we can see the next target at one point zero three to zero point nine four. Um, going forward, All right? Okay. So the next one will be uh Thai Beth. So Thai Beth, like mentioned last week. Um, it is still waiting to break above 0 0.71 to 0 0.715 uh, going forward. Uh, but unfortunately, last Friday, last Friday did have stellar rise, but uh, this today, it, it came down with a, with a strong selling. So uh, hence, I think you'll just be ranging uh, going forward. So next rebound, I'm eyeing at a long-term rebound at 0 0.635 to 0 0.650. Unless this uh, can be broken within the next few days, then I'll I'll see that the, the I will shorten my target to um the short, I will shorten the period of time um to achieve zero point seven eight to zero point eight eight uh zero point eight zero um to from a uh, month to to maybe a four, maybe a four weeks period okay uh Fraser Center Point Trust um still very much ranging my long term target two point seven nine to two point eight nine remains. I uh, can look at that. This corrective symmetrical triangle is still informing. So if you look at the wave from the wave perspective, um, we will have A, B, C, and then D, and then we have a E wave over here. So hence, um, right now, um, looking at a very strong ranging. All right. Okay. So the next one will be EB5 first resources. Um, last week mentioned there, there will be some uh, uh it, it did play out play out so I'm um, hence I'm I'm quite positive that uh it, it will just go down further for first resources. Okay, then the last one will be the escort residence trust. Uh escort uh fails uh, I did re release a report in early April, uh, but unfortunately price has entered to a stop out. Um price currently is in the Mount bearish uh, region. Uh, despite this ascending triangle, I think uh, price is going to break, have a breakout of the ascending triangle uptrend line um, and test the support at 0 0.86 to 0 0.90. All right. So next one is will be Hang Seng Tech. Hang Seng Tech, I remain bearish. 
um, as a reason why price um, still fails to break the resistance zone one. Uh, resistance zone two, even if you break resistance zone one, resistance zone two will be the major uh, resistance zone that will be uh, much tested. Uh, this falling wedge um, uh, might be here for long. So I uh, forgot to include that this um, support as 7392 to 76258. Uh, shall, if, if this one is strong about then, and then it has a higher chance of probability breaking resistance zone one uh, and then target resistance zone two. So look out for 7392 to 7628 uh, going forward. Okay. Uh, UOB OCBC. So uh, I'll just do uh, UOB. Uh, UOB um, prices has been um, like, uh, has like um, uh, fails to reach $27. So temporarily we are facing correction. So major support remains at 23.96 to 24.20. Uh, reason is because I think that uh, this will going to be a three wave corrective pattern. So if you look at, um, if you use a Fibonacci expansionary tool, uh, then you can see that uh, 1.27, 1.38 is, is, uh, is also a, a very strong uh, upside going forward, okay? And then, um, or price have a deeper correction into 22.54 before we got. All right, but I think higher probability that $24 region, this region will be the higher uh, range for uh, for a strong rebound. Okay. Okay, so OCBC, um, OCBC, I did release a thought. So, uh, like mentioned, like OCBC, uh, you have a true way pattern. So, I likely is going to hit for a breakout, uh, stop out uh, after a limited uh, upside. So um, looking for a, a rebound between this region, okay? At uh, this region between this uh, 1.272 to 11.24 going forward. Uh, if you are looking for like a, like a once to one, sorry, uh, once to one of the, of the true wave corrective move. So this is a one, two, and then uh, we have a stop wave covering, uh, covering coming down. Okay, so next one will be uh, before I pass my time to parents for that uh, for the banks. Uh, ABC. So ABC, I'm very bearish. Uh, so let me find my RJ. So ABC, I did re release a report based on this one wedge and based based on this uh, uh, higher time frame uh, inverted head and shoulder. But uh, since that is go not going to um, be be that strong. Hence, I'm looking for a uh, support at 2.38 to 2.45 going forward. So price will, will continue to go down uh, this way. So uh, in the waiting time frame, this may be a false, uh, this will be maybe a bad, a bull trap going forward. Okay. So next one. And then Great Wall Moto 233. So Great Wall Moto, um, I'm, uh, it's a bullish play. First of all, the resistance zone has been tested multiple times. So one, two, three, four. So if this bullish candle can sustain, uh, expect some pullback um, tomorrow. If this bullish candle sustains, so it will be this, and then come down and then break up on the upside, targeting $32 psychological resistance, okay? So next one is Sun Power. No, it's not Sun Power. Okay, Sun Power, uh, likely I'm, go I'm heading down to the... Okay, give me a moment. So something like this, uh, between support zone one and support zone two, which is around 7.05 to 7.80, there will be a potential rebound up on the upside. So this will be like, a, a, instead of a panel, uh, it will be more like a, 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 a bullish flag, okay? So this is like a bullish flag. So recently, I think because of the market upheaval uh, of the inflation rate, a lot of stocks are ex exhibiting, including US stocks, um, mainly the financials. They are, ex um, they are showing a lot of blue tracks. So be careful going forward. All right. Okay, BVA, top row I shared. So, uh, Yang Zijiang, Yang Zijiang, uh, VS6. Oh, where's my VS6? Okay, Yang Zijiang. Uh, Yang Zijiang panel formation, uh, as mentioned uh, last week, uh, where are we now? Uh, price is testing the support, the resistance support at 1.34 to 
can uh, let's see if we can uh, sustain this uh, bullish upside on the move. All right, so lo longer term, the bullish pattern is uh, represent a very strong uh, bullish pattern going forward. All right. Okay, so uh, it, it, it. Uh, I will do buy two, and then uh, buy two. Firmly, I'm still on downtrend. My my view don't change. Uh, JD.com, uh, downtrend as well. Very depth cross going forward. Um, with the hunting tech is um trending on a on a mildly bearish time uh tone. Uh, with this inverted head and shoulder not showing any strong momentum, um, I'm staying neutral for now for JD. Okay, so I think um, um, right now I've uh, I think due to time constraint, I shall pass my back my time back to my colleague, uh, for the the rest of Q and A. Thank you. Yeah, I think there, there are some follow up questions to the bank. So I, I'll just I'll just read them out as well. So the first question, uh, Terence, I'm not as optimistic as you. City and JPM have want of lower trading income in second quarter 2021. Peak trading income for banks in first quarter 21 after a huge recovery of the pandemic low in March 20. In their words, first quarter 21 was an exceptional quarter. Besides pressure from a flattening yield curve, Singapore banks have to grapple with three additional headwinds. The first is heightened alert phase two lockdown in Singapore, COVID still raging hard in Thailand, Malaysia and Indonesia, moderating growth in China's economy as evidenced by May key macro indicators. Any comments? Yeah, so the, your, 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 your points are valid. Uh, the, the, I think the challenge, the COVID-19 challenge uh, still remains for the banks in terms of in terms of the the but we for us though we remain bullish because number one the for most of the banks after they they moved out of the loan moratoriums they 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 reported that the the npl ratios the non-performing loan ratios actually remain stable so they have even though they they wrote off the 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 moratorium, loan moratoriums, they, they haven't seen a spike in the non-performing loans. Uh, and, and that, that we believe, is a testament to the very, very strong asset quality inherent within the three local banks. So across the three local banks, the current loans under moratorium based on the first quarter 2021 results it's just about five to six percent left. So this five to six, after this five to six percent of loans under moratorium roll off uh, we, we believe the the asset quality will be even clearer so for as of now the the bank the banks uh, are guiding for for non-performing loans to remain stable based on our latest conversation with them they don't they don't they, don't, they haven't made any changes even though we, we've gone into phase two uh, like what you mentioned phase two heightened alert but they they, they, are, they are not tweaking their 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 model uh, upwards in terms of MPL. So for full year net interest income, they, I, for, for the banks and also in, internally, we are also guiding for a mid single digit growth. So because of st NIM stabilizing, I think there are some questions about NIM, so we'll, we'll go into those later. But we, the, for the net interest income, the, the banks are still expecting this to be about mid single digit, so about 5%, which is also in line with our internal forecast. And then non-interest income is still expected to grow by double digit. So in the, the, the banks the banks provide a, a, a wider range, but for our non-interest income, this is still expected to grow uh, double digit. So, so we, we're expecting about 18 to 21% growth for financial year 2021. And, and that is on the back of two, two main things. Number one, the wealth management income is going up. So you, you did mention trading income which is which is also valid but the 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 one the main driver for them is actually the wealth management fees uh, the second driver for them is the 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 credit card fees uh, these have already reached pre pandemic levels uh, in the first quarter of 2021 so for the the rest of 2021 i think we expect the 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 credit card fees to actually uh, see a single uh, digit growth high single digit growth so that 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 will prop up the overall uh, non interest income and of course the the general provisions, uh, 
reversal will also boost overall earning, earnings across the, the the board for the banking sector. We, we I think the there is no change, uh, even from the bank side, no change to the expectation for the rest of, for for full year twenty twenty one to see about twenty percent uh, increase in the the overall net income. So you, I think I think you there are two other points you brought up in terms of uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, uh, still, still, the the the, the ongoing uh, COVID nineteen uh, in in some of the Southeast Asian ASEAN economies, which is valid. Uh, the but for the the one that will be most impacted among the three banks, I think they they all be impacted by in varying degrees. But the one that is most uh, impacted by by this ASEAN economies is actually UOB. So. For but for UOB, there are a lot of their their assets are collateralized. So the even though you're right that the that COVID nineteen is is uh still raging hard in in this these economies, but the but because a lot of these assets are collateralized, so the 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 possibility of NPLs actually spiking, in our opinion, based on our assessment today, is still very low. As for as for the the China economy. Uh, moderating, uh, that 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 again is valid. But what what you're talking about is the entire China economy moderating. But the if, if you look at the bank's exposure to China, they they actually they are actually exposed not to the, the whole of China, but the 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 greater the the chi the greater China region, which is your 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 Macau, your Hong Kong, and your some of the southern parts of, of China. So it's, it's not, you, you cannot look at the, the entire China economy as a whole versus the, the Greater Bay China area, which is what the banks are targeting. And so why, why is the Greater Bay area uh, more important? Because those are, I think the, those are what the banks identify as the, the, the more faster growing uh, cities in China. So as a whole, you're right, but the, the cities in which uh, DBS and OCBC are targeting are actually still okay uh, in terms of in terms of growth. Yeah, so I, I hope I I I I answered your, your question because it's a bit long. But if I, I didn't also that just just feel free to let me know. So, so I'll go on to the next question. Uh, what what high times? Why are the the share prices of banks trending down when rate hikes are expected to come earlier? And also, you mentioned that the cap on dividend payout may be lifted by MAS. Yes, so the 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 probability of of rate hikes happening sooner rather than later has increased. The but, but we 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 see some near term near term sell off. Uh, also because mainly because of the the DBS, uh, issue which I elaborated earlier. So, uh, we we but again we see that the issue as one off and temporal. So we we don't we 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 see this 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 sell down as. Uh, being 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 a reaction to that, uh, we, we we see we see we see we see the uh, a reversal also happening likely sooner rather than later, and also the the cap on dividend payout. Yeah, I think I think I think the the that 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 is, that is one of the, the biggest questions uh, on everybody's mind minds as to when they will leave the dividend payout, and, and because nobody really knows. Uh, so so th this will likely this will likely uh remain an overhang on the on the stock the the we internally we when we look at the dates we think that there are uh some dates that they will they will try to do uh some of these dates are like september um maybe because uh, and why also why september because the september it's is uh and by the way we just want to qualify like this these are own own assessment only because the, amongst the, the the three banks only dbs pays dividends on a quarterly basis so if MAS want to make the announcement, they have to make it before DBS announce the dividends, not OCBC and UOB. So, uh, because DBS typically announce their their dividend their dividend in October or November, we don't think it's this this second quarter lah, Because we just came out of the phase two heightened alert, so it's still it's, it's still a little bit early to to do it. Though again, we, we really don't know, but we but they could announce it in September, October, just before DBS announced their quarterly dividend. So if they, they announce a, a lifting of the cap, what most of the banks have said is that they will move back to the pre-COVID uh, dividend distribution already. So we, so it will likely happen then. Uh. Though, 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 though this, this situation also depends on the how the COVID-19 pandemic continue to pan out in Singapore. Yeah. 
the next question with unexpected earlier interest hike plan in 2023 from FOMC meeting, meeting, what could be the interest rate cyborg future outlook for Singapore in two years? Yeah, so the, the, I, the we are, because we are interest rate taker for Singapore, so if, if the, the interest rate hike does happen earlier than expected again in 2023, then we, we think the, the interest rate trajectory for the Singapore market in the next two years will be up in, in line with the, in line with the, the rate hike in, in the US because we are interest rate taker. So we got, we got no control on the interest rates in Singapore. So we just follow. Yeah. Uh, upside on UOB. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, our, 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 you, you, we, we continue to maintain and accumulate rating on UOB. So no change uh, to our, our call on UOB. Yeah, our, our target price is $28. Yeah. Uh, next question, banks, do you think the price already priced in the removal of dividend cap by MAS and likely reversal of provisions? Uh, the, the short answer to this is yes. We, we believe the, 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 the market has already priced in some of these, the, these catalysts that we've been talking about, uh, such as the removal of the dividend cap by the DBS and also the likely reversal of the general provisions that they made, but, but not fully because the, the again, and uns the, there's still some uncertainty with regards to when they will do it. I think nobody knows. La. And based on the last first quarter results uh, that the banks announced, they also say that MES hasn't approached them uh, with regards to this discussion. So we don't think it will happen soon also. But the, we, we think that the, some, some of this pricing in has happened, but not, not fully. Yeah. Let me just see if there's any more questions uh, before I pass on to my, the rest of my colleagues. Okay, so that's one. Are, are the long-term and short-term bond rates trending down and up respectively affecting NIM of banks? Uh, no, not really. La. So the, 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 the kind of short-term gyrations, the, the, there's only a very minor impact, but actually the, the Cyborg and the SOAR, and also even the SORA, which they are using recently, have, have been quite stable. So the, 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 NIM, the NIM of the banks, uh, have have been have been stable, and I think for uh, trending about one point five percent to uh, about one point five seven percent. So I think for the full year, we don't expect any at, at this moment. We don't expect any any change. In fact, one point five seven percent the of, of NIMS is the same as fourth quarter of twenty twenty. So we don't we don't see see NIMS uh uh having any much volatility for the rest of the year. Uh, yeah, I think that's all for, for the bank. So if I did answer, just, just let, let me know. Yeah, that's all. Thanks. Since, so, 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 yeah, thanks so, since, since there are so many questions on, on banks, let me just add, uh, you know, for trading income, right, the economy is more important than trading income. Uh, I think how the economy fares, trading income is, is very volatile. I'm not sure what context JPCT and JP Morgan's trading income is, but you ask any bank analyst, it's almost impossible to forecast trading income. We tried to like, look at VIX and, all, and so forth. So that's volatile and more important is the, is the overall economy. So, so what we think is that there could, there's one more leg for the banks. Uh, that last leg would be, not last leg, um, one more leg, hopefully not the last, but at least there's one more leg for the banks in terms of the share prices is from the economy really returning on a stronger footing. Then we will see loans growth and uh, net interest margins improving because loans growth is now 1%. That's hardly any... Uh, then NIMS is like record lows. So we think that could be the, the next leg for the, sh the banks to move up. And, and that's one last point. Uh, the current phase two uh, HA that we are, I think we need to look past that. This will not be the status quo. Uh, the authorities have really mentioned, I think by October, uh, assuming we hit the targets of 75% fully vaccinated, you can expect very aggressive reopening. I think that's what they've mentioned. There's going to be a broader set of reopenings uh, once the vaccination has, uh, like, a, like 70, 75, like I mentioned earlier, hit vaccinated. They're not really detailed, but I think they're going to be very aggressive. Maybe 10 people. I'm not sure what they're going to do, but borders will be reopened more aggressively. I think with that, they got a lot more confidence that uh, they can reopen and, the, and any signs of lockdowns or that will be, will, uh, temporary lockdowns will be, will be behind us uh, almost permanently. I, I think that is what we think could happen 
and and that's why we think the economy could accelerate on a uh, stronger footing in the coming quarters, and and that is what that can help bring the banks up. Since since there's so many questions on banks, uh, I'm moving on to to Natalie. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Um, yes, I think there are some questions for me. Um, so I think the first question was uh, with regards to ascenders. Uh, I think it was uh, what's the reason for for the divestment of the three logistics um, assets in in Australia? So um, as mentioned, the divestment actually is um, sixteen point eight percent above book, and typically when um, the book value or rather the market valuation um, that was registered um, and input into the, the balance sheet was actually done on December 31st, uh, 2020. So that actually um, it uses, usually uses a combination of several um, valuation methods. One of them would be the DCF. So you discount the, the rental or the or the you know from the existing leases as well as the forecasted leases for a period of time, uh, let's say it's ten years, and then you discount it back to the to the current um, so called um, you know market valuation or or yeah, the valuation. So uh, the divestment, of course, um, being above book valuation um, is is a relatively compelling reason for for accepting the the offer, and I think that will actually allow uh, ascenders to. Um, realize the upside from you know even above um yeah and realize the upside immediately yeah so i think that was that was the main reason uh, for the divestment okay um sorry let me find some of the questions uh, paul if you want you can go ahead first uh, okay sure um okay so i missed out some of the questions but uh, let me just read. What was your opinion on SIA? Um, actually, we are not that favorable on on SIA because uh, the the market cap. I mean, it's a nice tech trading play uh, for reopening, but the market cap is really you know much higher than even pre COVID levels. Uh, I guess a more conservative way to play would be the like uh, I don't know, Genting or and I don't know, even MM MM two if you want if you are playing on the reopening. Uh, the other question is, I'm just reading because I dialed in a bit late because I disconnected. Uh, could you comment on Wilma? Uh, prices keep coming down. Do you recommend ex ex exiting invest uh, existing investors to continue to keep this share? I um, again, we don't cover, but I think the upcoming second quarter earnings uh, could be weak. I think uh, the soy soybean crushing margins have actually been very weak, according to them in the last briefing. And then palm oil prices have also weakened. So we just think that you might have to just go past this second quarter uh, big earnings that's coming out. Uh, but you know the business is still uh, is, is still very strong, especially in China, with their with their consumer branded uh, um, products from oil to flour, and they're also moving into uh, uh, into central centralized kitchen. And as the as the country moves into more centralized kitchen. Uh, that's even bigger opportunity for Vilma. So we think short term, uh, second quarter earnings might be weak, and that could be the one of the reasons why uh, that that's hurting the share price. Uh, let me just run through this 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 last one. I'll hand it over to you. I'm just reading it off because I missed it. Uh, overstock markets are in decline. Is equity the preferred asset class to hold? What's your outlook? Is it an opportunity to buy into the market or to the beginning of a free fall? Oh no, I don't think it's a free fall. If you look at the STI, I think compared to pre pre COVID, the STI in end 2019 was about 3,002. So we are still down compared to pre COVID levels. So it's not like we rallied past pre COVID and we're assuming things are back to normal. So the STI ha has not like recovered all the, the the losses since the pandemic. And then uh, is is equity the preferred? I think I think much better than bonds. Uh, maybe Timothy has a different view, but. Uh, you know, when, when interest rates are rising, then obviously bond prices are going to get hit the most. So equity will be the mo um, most preferred. Uh, for us, uh, we like, I think as for our model portfolio, we like those REITs that have uh, high yielding, uh, high yielding uh, dividend yield. I, I think maybe uh, Nettie can also fill you up. Like some of the US REITs, I think 
uh, US dollar asset being you know, 78% yield, I thought that is actually quite attractive for us. Uh, if, uh, for the more no risk averse kind of clients. Okay, I think that's it from, from my side. Uh, I think I'll move on to you, Natalie. Let's answer this last one beforehand. Um, as tank IPO is interesting, why the sudden crash, though the IPO has quite a success, in, in, is it the right space? Any thoughts? Thanks. Okay, I'll be met them. We don't cover also for Aztec. Uh, we met them, and you, you know, I think one thing that could be hurting them is because you know their major customer is Amazon. Or, uh, I mean, uh, for those who don't know, I mean, it's rumored to be Blink the customer. I'm not sure, but that's the rumor. Uh, and and there's uh, there's I guess there's some fears that uh, the U.S. authorities are trying to clamp down on. Uh, Amazon's ability to sell their own products on their own uh, uh, marketplace. So that could be one worry. Uh, but if you strip that out, uh, because this is beyond us to, to comment whether that, that eventually the uh, uh, US government is going to pull that away from them, that they can sell their own products. I think Amazon is, 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 is very powerful. I think we spoke to some people, some sellers that sell, uh, that, that sell their products on Amazon. And you know, Amazon technically on paper have all the data. So they know the best prices, which product sells the best, which products are the most popular, which products has the, the, the best price points. Uh, and they, they own all the customers. Uh, so if a customer like Aztec has a customer which is uh, supposed to be Amazon, then I think Aztec looks good. I mean, at least from my point of view, provided there is no regulatory oversight on, the, um, on Amazon. Yeah. Because you sell, I think the Amazon's are the biggest battery seller now. Because they, uh, in the world, because they got uh, the best pricing, they can source the all the materials and everything. That's what I I understand. But anyway, uh, I, we don't cover. But this is just some uh, personal commentary. Uh, I move on to you, uh, uh, Natalie. Uh, okay, one more question for me is: Can you comment on the provisional rights issue by Maple Tree Industrial REITs? Um, so of course this um this rights issue, I believe it's actually the preferential offering uh, five to one. Um, it has already been completed and the, the reason for this fundraising, it was done in conjunct, in con, <laughs> it was done together with a uh, private placement. So total, total um, the total uh, equity fundraising actually raised about $800 million. Um, and it was to fund the 29 um, data center acquisition, yeah. Uh, in the United States, so that twenty that portfolio of twenty nine data centers um, is actually um, valued at one point eight million Singapore dollars. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know what else to comment about about this. Um, other than it is it both of the both of the private placement as well as the uh, preferential offering, they were both um, oversubscribed three point one times and one point seven times. Um, additionally, I think the current market price of two dollars seventy nine cents is actually above the third price as well as the issue price. So, I, I, um, in general, um, the market still viewing this um, acquisition still quite favorably. Okay. Uh, let me just do this quick one. Uh, hi, Paul. Can we have access to Marco Polo Marine Webinar that held last week? Uh, apologies for that. We don't, most of the listed companies don't want to record their webinar. So that's why we, I mean, we would like to also record for a lot of people who cannot make it on that time for during those time slots. But I, I think most listed companies uh, don't want to record in, in case they, they make some inadvertent statements and so forth. So that's why we, we, we it always has to be live and no recording. Yeah, I hope that helps. Thanks. Uh, move, uh, over to you, Annette. Okay, uh, one more question is, uh, which US REIT is uh, better by now, Prime or Manulife? Uh, I think both of the REITs, uh, both of the US REITs, they actually deliver almost, I mean, we are forecasting a DPU, a 521 DPU of about 8%. Um, and as of right now, um, for the US REITs, we, we see that there has been a bit of a pickup in, in the market, um, or, or rather the leasing, leasing momentum in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, in terms of which would be a better buy, give me a second. Okay, so uh, based, on, based on our calculations and uh, the target price, which is, we see that the, the REIT, which has a better upside would be, 
actually almost, almost comparable. So menu life, um, the total upside is about 21.7% and for prime is about 20.4%. Uh, portfolio wise, um, prime does have um, a larger exposure to the more tech and uh, biomedical kind of uh, tenants. Yeah. So um, we would say that they are, they're both quite comparable right now. Yeah. I'll hand over the time to Wayran for now. Um, I think through the time constraint, um, I will take the final um, um, on, the, uh, on the technical analysis. So I think a lot of people are asking about Wilma. So Wilma, right, if you can look closer, uh, Wilma has already broke out of the, um, of the um, whatever do you call it, uh, the, the panel, the bearish panel. So price is hovering around the 1.618 and 1.382 region. So expect some pullback, but uh, ultimately price is going to target 4.37 and 4.25 before rebound uh, going forward. So the 4.15 to 4.37 uh, is likely the, the strongest support zone, a major support zone that we have. All right, so yeah. So nano firm. So nano firm. Okay, so now from I mentioned right, uh, the support and resistance zone, uh, this this level, um, price uh, will need will, will will likely need to need to go forward. Uh, go, need to, uh, like, like what I mentioned on the I think, last webinar. Yep. Uh, so the the corrective flat or this wave one, uh, is either is going to be, uh, X or going to be wave one. It depends on five dollar and five dollar nine cents uh support term resistance zone. All right. So uh, okay. So let me see any question for that. Okay. So Ping An is the next uh hot topic. Uh, so Ping An is still on the downtrend bearish death cross uh, on the daily chart. Uh, although on the weekly it looked like it's a range, but uh, price is likely going to to go down further to $64.60 uh, before a major rebound. So uh, judging from this, I think Ping An is a no-go for now. All right. So with that, uh, I end off my uh, my site uh, because I got a webinar later on. Uh, Paul, do you have anything to add before we close off uh, today's session? Yeah, okay. Uh, so okay, let me just try one last question. Uh, this is the last one, sorry. Uh, in inflation turns out to be more permanent and not transitory. The violent rotation that we are seeing now might perpetuate things. Okay, I don't think it's a violent rotation now. I think maybe one two percent in the market. If I'm not mistaken, the last one two days I wouldn't call it violent. But uh, you are right. I mean, if if you no know, inflation suddenly surges to four five percent, then the market will take a hit, mainly because then the Federal Reserve will need to throttle down everything. They need to slow down uh, the U.S. economy. They need to raise rates aggressively. Uh, but I think. That could be a bit of a stretch because you know next year there won't be uh, the fiscal stimulus that all the whole US is enjoying now. But if you want to go into a very like permanent, very runaway inflation, then of course all oh, the market will will, will 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 clearly drop because the 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 Federal Reserve have just to ramp up interest rates aggressively to stem to stem this out. I mean, yeah. But that's on paper. I mean, this thing, this is the obvious thing. Okay, I, I think with that, uh, thanks everyone for. For taking your time and all your questions. Uh, again, if you don't answer, can, you can just uh, post the questions in Stocks BNB and we will try our best to answer them. And uh, again, thanks so much for attending and uh, we hope to see you at 11 15. And if you do have time, uh, sign up for our events on, on the Poems website. Th thank you, everybody, and take care. Bye.